Hello everyone and welcome back to another Half Pint session. Today we have a returning guest to the show, Alan Sisto, the man of the West. Uh, we interviewed him and his co-host a little while back, but they're not satisfied with just doing podcasting, they have a book coming out. Uh, so let's find out more about that. Alan, first of all, welcome back to the show. Well, thank you again for having me. It's, it does feel like it's been a while. I'm certainly glad to be back. And yeah, you're right. For some reason, Sean and I just decided that, uh, you know, talking into a microphone wasn't enough. We needed to put pen to paper, at least virtually speaking, and write a book. And here it is, in fact. So important, I put it in front of my folio edition of The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> it's called <laughs> Why We Love Middle Earth. And it came out in the U.S. September 12th uh, to some rave reviews, I might add. And it releases in the UK and Europe on October 12th. The audiobook should also release sometime in October as well. I don't think I have a precise date for that, though. Mm -hmm. I'm specifically waiting for the audiobook because both I'm an audio learner, I have a toddler, yeah. and also, you know, it would just be like ah. a really extended version of the Prancing Pony podcast. But we'll get to the book in a moment. Uh, but let's rewind a moment and let's talk about the podcast. If somebody has been living under a rock, um, doesn't like Tolkien for some reason. Who knows? Oh, uh, well, what is this podcast you do? Well, the Prancing Pony podcast is something that Sean Marchese, the Lord of the Mark, and I began in, my goodness, I think our very first episode came out in February of 2016, so seven and a half years ago. Uh, the idea at the time was just to get together and chat our way through the Legendarium. We decided to be pretty brave and start off with the Silmarillion, but not before we started by addressing on fairy stories and mythopoeia, sort of really get foundational with, you know, who Tolkien was, why he was writing fantasy, what fantasy meant to him, to sort of build a framework. And then, yeah, we dove straight into the deep end with Aina Lindele and moving right on in to the rest of the Silmarillion. We did that for about a year and a half and kind of irregularly. It was mostly every other week. Sometimes we threw in specials, interviews, uh, but then in the fall of 2018, we decided, once Apple decided to start supporting this idea of seasons, that we would take a short break and then do the rest of the Legendarium book by book through each season. And so we did The Hobbit in season two, and then The Lord of the Rings, as anybody knows, is six actual books in three volumes for one story. And we've been doing each book as a season of the podcast. So seasons three, through seven have been the first five books of the Lord of the Rings and book six, the conclusion of the return of the King is this season. And, uh, the season has already started. We started with uh, a live recording from Oxenmoot and then we're doing our usual questions after nightfall before we dive into the tower of Kirithungal. So it should be a lot of fun. <laughs> and this past season has been a little different because, yes. uh, you have been the sole consistent host. Now, That's I've correct. been trying to get rid of Matt for years. So how did you do it? How did you push him out? <laughs> well, I think it helped that I had Sean coming up back. Uh, you know, Sean did have to step down in the summer of 22. His, uh, his day job commitments were just a little bit, uh, you know, too heavy for him to keep doing the show full time. Thankfully, he was able to, to work with me to finish the book. And he has come back. You know, he's not, he hasn't left the show. He's just left as full time co-host. So he did come back for a, a run of episodes on on the um, uh, the Battle of the Pelennor Fields because, of course, he had to have the moment of Eowyn killing the Witch King. <laughs> and he also came back for, I think, a half a dozen more uh, philology fairs. So he's still doing his word nerdery for us on the Prancing Pony podcast. But, yeah, I was able to bring in a, um, a cabal of amazing co-hosts, uh, including, and I'm going to forget somebody, so please forgive me, but including Corey Olson, the Tolkien professor, uh, Don Marshall, the uh, obscure Lord of the Rings facts guy on TikTok, uh, Dr. Sarah Brown from Signum University and uh, the Tolkien Experience podcast. Uh, my goodness, uh, Matt, of course, the nerd of the rings, knew better, do better uh, from TikTok. Marcel, uh, the Tolkienist, uh, he's better known as. And, and uh, James Tauber from the Digital Tolkien Project. And again, mm -hmm. I think I've got everybody, but I may not. Oh, and Sean Gunner, the chair of the Tolkien Society, who would absolutely slay me if he was the only one that I forgot. So, <laughs> yeah, there's some amazing people. It was a wonderful time. Everybody brought something new to the game. So how are you doing it this coming season? Are you keeping the, the same sort of platform? 
Similar, similar. We are making a few differences. I felt like one of the things that these co-hosts could really benefit from was a longer run on the show. Some of them only had three episodes. Some had maybe five. And that felt like it was really hard to get uh, the sort of chemistry and banter that Sean and I had developed over the course of seven years. It's really not fair to ask somebody to come in and hit the ground running at that speed. So uh, some of them did fantastically well. Actually, they all really did. But what I wanted to do this season was focus on fewer co-hosts and longer runs. So I think we're only doing five blocks this season. Don Marshall, the obscure Lord of the Rings facts guy on TikTok, is taking the first block with me. He'll walk through a questions after nightfall, so, uh, several episodes on the Tower of Kirith Ungle, and possibly an interview. And then we'll move on into the second block where Matt will be joining me, the nerd of the rings, uh, to get me through um, um, the Land of Shadow and, of course, Mount Doom and the destruction of the ring itself before Dr. Sarah Brown will join me for uh, the chapters immediately following, including, of course, the steward and the king. So we get to spend more time talking about Eowyn together. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. It should be a great run. Me too, me too. Uh, and with that, now let's talk about this book that you've been working on in all of the spare time that you apparently have. Quite, <laughs> which is rather limited, which explains how, why we had to keep asking our, our publisher for an extension to the deadline. But yes, here it is, all 340-some-odd pages of it, all 105,000 words. That's what happens when a publisher asks you for 70,000. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're very proud of it. it. It was, it was, it felt like quite the accomplishment, I have to say. Yeah. And I mean, what are you covering in it? Is it is it is it just a panegyric as to why Tolkien is you know the best inkling? I mean, why that's he's obviously the best? Incorrect, why everybody but... should love Tolkien? Yeah. <laughs> in a way, in a way, we really wanted to design the book in a way that would appeal to Tolkien fans at all different levels, right? We wanted to be able to appeal to the fan who maybe had never really heard of Tolkien or only peripherally until, let's say, The Rings of Power came out or even that terrible video game Gollum that came out. I mean, who knows how you got into the fandom? We don't care. We just want you to read the books and get involved the way you want to get involved. And so we wrote it in a way that appeals to them as well as folks who've been in the fandom for a while and including people like Sean and I who've been reading Tolkien for 30-plus years, who know it inside and out, because there's sections on everything. We have a section on the books themselves that sort of walks people through everything from Tolkien's writing process to some of the story and theme elements, uh, but mostly why the book is so great. You know, from It's the Hobbit to The Lord of the Rings to The Silmarillion and Unfinished Tales. We then talk about the history of Middle Earth a little bit. We talk about non-legendarium works. And the intention there was to to meet people wherever they are in the fandom, right? So if you've not read The Hobbit, here's, here's a, ch a chapter on that. If you've read the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings, well, why haven't you read the Silmarillion? Let's tell you about that and why you should. So we explain to people sort of a basic reading order, uh, which is, I think, a big question that we get asked a lot. We're asked that a lot more often than we're asked about Balrog wings or why the Eagles didn't take the ring to Mordor. Uh, you know, what order should I read the books in and why? And so we address that. And then there's a huge section on adaptations because we know a lot of people are coming to Tolkien through the adaptations. So we do a chapter on the early adaptations. There's a chapter on Bakshi's Lord of the Rings. There's a chapter on the Rankin-Bass Hobbit, the Rankin-Bass Return of the King, for better or for worse, in all three cases. And then there's a very lengthy chapter, of course, on Jackson's Lord of the Rings and another not quite as lengthy chapter on Jackson's Hobbit films because we were once told, if you can't say anything nice, don't say very much. I would have thought that you would just unnecessarily pad that chapter in homage to <laughs> the Hobbit movies. Yeah, it was uh, it was a lot of fun to write those. And then I think that my favorite part is that we wrote a third section of the book about the fandom itself, kind of explaining to folks how there are so many ways to express yourself in the Tolkien fandom. If you want to dive into the languages, if you want to do your own conlanging, like Professor Tolkien did, if you want to dive into Tolkien studies as an area of academia and, and to get a degree in that. If you want to plug yourselves into organizations like the Tolkien Society or Signum University or the Mythopoeic Society, ways to get involved in the fandom and do the things that you like to do. And we're excited for a sequel as well, assuming the book sells well enough. We're going to have a section on the fandom again that will include everything from cosplay to baking and brewing to you know uh, artwork and things like that so we're really excited for where this series goes and we're really hopeful 
Uh, and we think we've accomplished the goal that the book is accessible to all levels of Tolkien fans. Mm. It's particularly that last part that I'm most excited for, because as someone that's in the C.S. Lewis world, much more than I am in the Tolkien world, occasionally mm -hmm. I get to sort of peek over the fence and see what you guys are doing. And I think there are <laughs> definitely some things that the Tolkien community do much better than the C.S. Lewis mm. community. I mean, one of the things that we're launching this year is a C.S. Lewis reading day. And it's out of pure oh, jealousy, pure jealousy for the Tolkien reading day. I just realized, wait, why does idea. he get one and Lewis doesn't? Um, and so we're currently marshalling about 30 different content creators and organizations to make this a reality. Um, but I, 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 it's, it's, I'm entirely stealing from uh, the Tolkien uh, societies and the really good work that everybody seems to have done automatically that hasn't for some reason automatically translated over to the C.S. Lewis world. Hmm. I think that's a great idea. In fact, there are a lot of wonderful passages from Lewis that I would, you know, be honored to, to read at a future Lewis reading day. So, uh, you know, he's, he's right up there in my <laughs> mind. So fantastic. I can't wait to at least watch this first one. So very good. <laughs> yeah, I, I think getting involved in the fandom is what makes a fandom dynamic. And, you know, you've gotten to peek over the fence You've undoubtedly seen some of the, the negative stuff that's been happening in the fandom lately, really mm -hmm. ever since Rings of Power and, and sort of the, uh, the anger merchants coming in and sort of selling their vitriol uh, and, and getting people worked up over really non-existent reasons to be angry. Um, but what I've seen is that the fandom is resilient and those folks don't really dig into the fandom. They, they claim it and they don't really stay. They're not part of the community. The community itself, the real Tolkien fans, and I don't really even like using that word, so let me back that up. Um, the Tolkien fans who are committed to the community, those folks stick around and they plug in and they connect and they build community. And I'm sure there's something similar in the Lewis community and the Lewis fandom uh, to where people come together over their common love for this work and for the man. And uh, it's been something really neat to see. And to watch communities blossom over these last several years has been a joy. Mm. And I actually use your, your podcast as something as a lifeline, as someone that was watching the Rings of Power and really not enjoying it. It was, it was nice to be tempered by the various comments and you guys pointing out yep. what you thought was good, uh, particularly yep. because in the Lewis world, I think we are setting the stage for something possibly very similar because Netflix is now moving forward with the various Narnia movies. And oh, are I, they? I, yes, yes, uh, Greta Gerwig, who's, who's behind Barbie, oh, okay. she's apparently doing two of them, which I'm that actually kind of excited about. I think yeah. that's going to be really interesting, but I think it could also be very polarizing. So uh, we're, we're bracing ourselves for something similar. Indeed. I mean, I think, uh, I think all adaptations run the risk of being somewhat polarizing because people have very strong opinions as to what things should be like. And I'm old enough to remember the pretty strong polarization in the Tolkien fan community when the Jackson films came out. And I think the only reason it wasn't quite as destructive to the community was because social media wasn't as rampant. You had your message boards and that's about it. But people were just as upset back then about all sorts of crazy decisions. I mean, I remember Jackson being skewered for giving Arwen so many lines. Um, I can't remember all, but it was just ridiculous. I mean, it just so many of the arguments that now in hindsight seem completely absurd but yeah i mean yeah, you're right rings of power was not great uh it had its strengths but it definitely had its weaknesses especially in the writing and you know i'm hopeful but i'm not i'm no longer as optimistic as i was you know in august of last year when i thought all right we've seen some stuff i'm looking forward to it you know fingers crossed it looks like it could be good and it turned out to have some moments, you know, uh, it, it really did. Cinematography, um, uh, costumes, sets. I think the casting was spot on. But yeah, you know, the writing was was of questionable um, quality, shall we say. But, you know, fingers crossed, second season might be better. We'll give it a time. And there is also that adage that there's no such thing as bad advertising. So True. even if people are not liking the adaptation, hopefully the people that are complaining about it are at the very least pointing people back to the sources which they do love. And hopefully that will get more mm -hmm. people reading, more Tolkien, more yeah. Lewis. And you can never go wrong with that. I agree 100%. And we've had some folks who have come into the PPP community and started reading the books 
because they started by watching the Amazon show. Then they found the Rings of Power wrap up, which was the show that we did based on the, the Amazon show. And they heard about the PPP because we talked about it on that. So they went over to that show and now they're reading the books. And that's mm -hmm. really, that's a win. I call that a win. No matter how questionable issues are in the writing, if it got people in the door, we don't care how you got in the fandom. We're not gatekeepers. Our job is to be lore masters and help guide the way. And it's not to tell you whether or not you can be a fan because you came in the wrong door. That's crazy. And that's what I really see your book doing. It's providing the on-ramp yeah. for new people and also for people that yes. have, say, enjoyed Tolkien for many years, but they've never gone deeper than, say, The Hobbit and maybe The Lord of the yeah. Rings. And they've never, right. quite, never quite felt quite brave enough to tackle the Silmarillion. And I was that guy for a long time. And it was through your podcast that I, fi I finally made it through. I did what everybody did. I started trying to read it the first time by myself, failed about halfway through, stopped, mm -hmm. restarted, and then listened along with you guys. And that got me through to the end. And now I will point yeah. to various parts of the Silmarillion, which are actually my favorite bits of Tolkien. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I really wish that there'd been a resource like that for me when I first tried the Silmarillion. I think I bounced off of it six times between... The first time I tried to read it around 17 and the time I finally finished it around 23 or 24. Uh, but it has quickly become, I'm not going to say it's entirely my favorite because it's hard to say I have a single favorite, but it definitely has some of my favorite moments. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Hurin's Aure and Tuluva is my favorite moment in the entire Legendarium. Um, and then probably the most poignant moment is when he encounters Morrowin at the Stone of the Hapless after his entire story is done brings tears to my eyes every time. Uh, Tolkien proves to be a master of prose when you read the Silmarillion. It is unbelievable how he can master the tone shifts from The Hobbit to The Lord of the Rings to The Silmarillion. It is epic in scope. It really is. Well, as we wrap up, would you mind just recapping the name of your book, where yeah. people can find it, and the names of the podcast and YouTube channel that you run? Absolutely. Uh, the book is called Why We Love Middle Earth, an enthusiast's book about Tolkien, Middle Earth, and the Lord of the Rings fandom. And it is available really wherever you can get your books. So uh, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, your independent booksellers. We have links available at our website, which is theprancingponypodcast.com. Um, let's see, that's the book. And like I said, the audio book should be coming in October. A little bit of... Um, Official news to share on that. I don't have a date of release, but I can tell you that they did eventually succumb to the pressure that we kept putting on them to allow one of us to narrate it. We really wanted both of us. That was the desperate plea, but they said there was no practical way to do that, especially with Sean living nowhere near one of the studios that this company operates from. He wasn't able to come out to L.A. for a week, which is how long it took me to narrate the book. Uh, but I did do the narration all last week, and I go in for pickups next Friday. So sometime in October, you'll be able to pick up a copy on Audible or any of the other places where audiobooks are available. Uh, so that's that's the book. Then, of course, we have the PrancingPonyPodcast.com. We are at PrancingPonyPod on Twitter, Instagram. We're the Prancing Pony Podcast on Facebook. We're also r slash uh, PrancingPonyPod on Reddit. That's the weekly show that has been running now for seven and a half years and is entering its eighth season, ready to tackle book six of The Lord of the Rings. With a lot more still to come, I should add, we are planning on doing two seasons of additional Legendarium material so that I can cover everything from Aldarion and Arendis, which really should require a good 12 to 16 week run. Uh, we want to be able to dive into the statute of Finway and Muriel from the history of Middle Earth or the Athrabeth from the history of Middle Earth. These complete stories that are not part of the other books. So things from Unfinished Tales, things from History of Middle Earth, and things from the appendices to The Lord of the Rings. And then a season or two, I'm not sure yet which, of non-legendary material. So we'll cover Smith of Wooten Major, Farmer Giles of Ham, Leaf by Niggle, and so much more. And then finally, two more years of the Silmarillion. Come full circle. Now that we've learned all this, what have we learned from it? Right. Let's go back to the beginning. And uh, as as Fezzik once told his crew, let's go back to the beginning. Um, that's what we're going to do. And we're going to spend two years going through the Silmarillion. And that'll be the end of the Prancing Pony podcast, I suspect. In the meantime, I am doing a daily show, a short format daily show, about eight to ten minutes. It is uh, video and podcast. 
It is called Today's Tolkien Times. You can see the logo for it right here. And you can find it at Tolkien Times on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. Uh, it is Today's Tolkien Times. No, actually, it's just TolkienTimes.com. And you can find it uh, at Tolkien Times on YouTube, where we have finally breached the 1,000 subscriber mark, and we're very happy for that. But it runs Monday through Saturday every week uh, for eight-week seasons with two weeks off between seasons. And the third season comes out starting October 2nd, so I hope you'll join us there. And then Rings of Power Wrap-Up. That is a seasonal show. It will we'll start running it again six to eight weeks before Amazon launches season two of the Rings of Power wrap-up. I host that show with James Tauber and Dr. Sarah Brown, uh, and that is an exciting show, a lot of fun to kind of look at, analyze, and sometimes poke fun at the Rings of Power. Uh, but it's a good show. We really are proud of the work we do there as well. But uh, those are the three podcasts, the three shows, and that's the book, and I think that just about covers all of it. See, when people tell me that we produce a lot at Pints with Jack, I just point to you. It's like, <laughs> clearly this guy doesn't sleep because there's no way that any human could get that much stuff done. It uh, has been pretty tricky lately, I will admit. Yeah. And it's this, funny this when you said... <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny when you said, uh, we'll return to the Silmarillion and see what we've learned. The first thing I thought in my head was, well, if we're the elves, what did I learn? Nothing! Nothing! <laughs> <laughs> Nothing at all. Seven years. That's a drop in the bucket. We haven't learned a thing. <laughs> <laughs> this is wonderful. Alan, thank you for joining us. It really has been my, my pleasure to join you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I'll have to toast you with mere water today. <laughs> uh, it, it, it will do. It will do. We'll pretend it's ant wash. There we go. I like that. A little ant drop there. Please join us next time when we'll continue going further up and further in. Cheers. <laughs>